There. All right. Welcome. This was a pleasant surprise for me. <laughs> It's nice. It's one good thing about house church. You never know how many people are going to show up, but we're always happy when there's two or three or four or whatever, but we're glad you're here today. So we have a couple of new people with us. So we're glad you're here again. Say your names again. Uh, I'm Nikki. Nikki. What is it? Trinity. Trinity? Trinity. That's a good name. Trinity. All right. So uh, we're continuing our studying on the book of John and welcome all of you guys on Facebook and those will be watching on YouTube later and later this evening. Uh, it's an honor to be able to come to you today and uh, provide you uh, what I think to be a greater truth of the word than we've ever heard before. Uh, I know there were times when there were comforter teachers in the world like Jesus and other people possibly in the Middle East, which I highly believe there were. And I believe every generation there have been people that have been re have received truth. I don't believe we have to be given truth because the truth is always there. But I believe if we'll receive the truth, then the truth is there for us. And I always say people have to get to where they're questioning their theology because until you start questioning your theology, you can't go on any further. Just like in medical science, there came a time when there were people that began to question the way that they treated people, the way that they treated diseases and things like that, and realized there had to be more. And I'm believing for that in every system of this earth that people are going to, are going to wake up and say there's, there's a better way than what we've been doing because it's just not working. And so we've been through a long journey, probably, probably I would guess the last seven years, maybe a little, actually about nine, uh, 2012, that we really started uh, seeking Father for a spiritual understanding of the Word and how to live out of our spirit. Because for the most part, we've just been living out of a carnal awareness. And Paul said to be carnally mindful is death. And I've told you before, the word death in the Bible actually means no knowledge of God or no contact with Father. We do not have a carnal mind, though. The church took that to say that we have a carnal mind, and we do not. We have a divine mind. Yes. But we have a carnal awareness, or we can say we've been carnally mindful. Think about everything's about the outward man or whatever. And so we're going through the book of John. Last week I <clears throat> talked about the marriage supper, and uh, I had some interesting comments about where I said it doesn't matter whether you turn the water into wine or not. It, it was representing the living water, the Word of God. And so I personally don't believe he did. I believe it was filled up with water. Water is one of the mo most cherishable liquids in the world. I mean, without water, every living thing will die. And so I believe that the spiritual ac application to that, that Jesus was saying he is bringing the living water of life to mankind. And so today we're going to start with John 2.12. I've got notes for you there if you want them. So uh, John 2.12. <clears throat> And uh, for anybody new, uh, I'm teaching the metaphysical understanding of the word, and some people are afraid of the word metaphysical. I literally have lost some followers because I, I use the word metaphysical, but all it means is other than, other than physical. It means spiritual. So I could say spiritual or whatever, but there are people out there searching for metaphysical truth, so I want them to know that I'm doing that. So John 2.12 says... Uh, <clears throat> After this, after the, after the wedding, after what he did there, uh, Jesus went down to Capernaum, and he and his mother and his, his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there f uh, a few days, not too long. And verse 13, and the Jews' Passover was at hand, and so Jesus went to Jerusalem. And so this passage mentions this time for the Jewish Passover, which literally symbolizes their freedom or their liberation from Egypt. And Jewish people still uh, honor that today. They have their, what do they call it, a Shabbat dinner, something like that. <clears throat> and so metaphysically, this can be understood as a representation of our individual spiritual journey. Uh, Capernaum, when you look it up, it means village of consolation. It means shelter of comfort, and it means covering of compassion. And it refers to this inner conviction of an abiding uh, compassion in us that restores the power or the ability to know who we are. And, you know, uh, 
all through the Gospels, when it talked about Jesus going into the cities, the first thing that he did, it said he had compassion on them and he healed them. He had compassion on them and he, he did what they, he, he wasn't there to heal people. He was there to teach them truth. He was there to heal their understanding and their knowledge of who they were and to heal them by freeing them from religiosity. But, but he had compassion because that's all they wanted. So he, he did that. And so that this, this, when you have compassion over people, you can restore them and you can help them. And so when one enters this state of consciousness, it restores virtue. It literally makes all the discord uh, to harmony void in our life. Compassion is a very important uh, way to walk am amongst the world or in the world. Because without compassion, you don't care about other people. It's all about you. <clears throat> so in man, this Capernaum is located basically in our uh, abdominal region of our body. You know, because we talk a lot about where parts of our body represent different things. So Capernaum also means covering. So thus it indicates this cleansing of our conscious awareness both our conscious and our subconscious, because we know there's things in our subconscious that we've allowed in or that's been interpenetrated into it by others that still hinder us today. It can be things that happened to you in the past. It can be belief systems. It can be whatever that's deep into your subconscious. And sometimes you think, why do I think this? Or why do I still want to do this? You know, Paul said, when I would do good, I would do evil. And he said, it's because there's sin in, our, sin in my members. The word sin means mark missing, or it means a mistaken identity. So he was saying, in my subconsciousness, there's a mistaken identity. In my subconsciousness, it's been, been interpenetrated with a mosaic law. So what he was saying, I, I know I've been freed from that, but every once in a while, I, I had this tendency to want to go back to it. And that's why he asked God to deliver him from that. And God said, my grace is sufficient for you. Or he literally said, your spirit is sufficient fit with you. Go within, go within to your divine mind. So thus it indicates a cleansing of our conscious awareness. And in this cleansing attitude, when you have this attitude that you're, you want the word to cleanse you, not of sin, I mean, like we've been taught, or cleanse us from that, but cleanse us from false understandings. Free us from that. That's the greatest need that we have. The best altar call we can have is for people to come to receive the Logos, the, the spiritual creative activity that reveals the spiritual law of abundant life. That's what people need to receive, and they need to understand that. And they need to hear who they are. Uh, the whole world, in fact, all of us still, in some way or another, we still have an identity problem. I mean, just like us people that are more mature than you young people, <laughs> talk about age wise we still kind of identify with our age because that's what we've been taught all of our life you know and there seems to be evidence there that we are weaker we can't do what we used to do but that's the product of our long-held belief system all of our life that well after all you're 60 what do you expect I mean when I told my heart doctor a long t a few months ago that you know how bad I felt and everything and and he was he's he likes to be humorous with me and Donna. Donna was in there and he underlined my birthday. I, I saw him doing something. I've told some of that you guys that already. But he, he walked up to me and he showed me my age, seventy two. I mean, so he was identifying with that. Well, what do you expect? You're seventy two years old. You're not gonna feel like a twenty or thirty year old or forty year old anymore. So he's seventy four. Huh? You're seventy four. No, he's seventy. I thought I was seventy two then. Well, maybe, say, don't remind me that I'm 74. See, see there, my own wife does it. <laughs> so, but that applies to everything. It applies to the way that you grew up, the way you live, what somebody did to you. You can literally identify with that. People write whole books on what was done to them and they talk about it year after year after year. But what, it, what was done to you is not who you are. It's just something that was done to you. And so when we sat in church and they raped us for religiosity, that was done to us, but it's not who we are. And we had to get to that place where we can rise up from that. So such a person has lived in this outer realms of consciousness where materiality reigns. And in a sense, we still struggle with a lot of materiality. But now they've come to, the, to realize there's another realm where we can literally, we can get acquainted 
with the spiritual truth, acquainted with it, to actually know that we are spiritual, we are spirit. There was a post on Facebook today, a guy asking about what we thought the position of, quote, the Holy Spirit was. And I wrote on there, I said, we are spirit and we are holy. Jesus said all are holy, but few choose to live that life. It just means that they were told that they're either sinners or sinners saved by grace. They never felt that they're holy, but you, you are holy. You late young ladies, you guys were born holy and you can never lose that. And, and you, were, you were born spirit and you can never use that. So literally we had to get acquainted with our spirit because most of our life we have got acquainted with a false belief of who we were. We were told up there that we're just a bunch of sinners and we sat in church and what did we say? Amen. I mean, I've heard people say we sin every day and we say, amen. And so what, you know what amen means, anybody? So be it. Just so be it or be it unto me. And we said that all the time. So this is a picture of Jesus in Mark one twenty one. that's not in your notes, but he entered into the synagogue and it says, and they went into Capernaum and straightway on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught, the, taught them as one that had authority, not as the scribes. In other words, even more authority, more understanding than the scribes. So what happened to him from age about five years old to about 12 years old? He was out learning from this scenes and probably others. But then from the, after 12 years old, uh, from the synagogue on, you hear nothing about him till he's 30 years old because he's out learning. And how much did we really learn when we went to church? I mean, really, we learned a bunch of Bible stories, right? And I was thinking about this, and I don't disdain anybody for doing this. I've never done it. But there are people that have read all the way through the Bible. What did it do for them, honestly? It just gave them a certificate that they read all the way through the Bible because it did nothing for them. It's just a surface level of the Word. They were not getting acquainted with spirit, right? And that's what we want to do is realize really what spirit is, whose spirit is. We are spirit. Father is spirit. We are one. There is no Holy Spirit out there somewhere. The only time Holy Spirit's anywhere is when you're there or when another person's there. So Capernaum represents a state of higher awareness where one is connected to their inner divine mind. And Jesus connected with his divine mind. That's what we, we have, the divine mind. Uh, the Bible talks about the mind of Christ. And just for you late, young ladies, the word Christ actually means contact. So it means the mind of contact. Contact with who? Contact with spirit. Contact with Father, if you would. And so Jesus connected with his divine mind, and that represents this constant state of being one, constant state of, of, of living and moving and having your being out of a divine consciousness. Whether you're on vacation, whether you're working, whatever you're doing, you can stay in contact with the divine mind. And uh, when you're traveling, I mean, I've, when I, I've done a lot of traveling myself, Don and I have, Anna and Carl, and I know you guys have, but uh, there's never been a place that I've gone that I didn't hear something spiritually or see something spiritually. Mm -hmm. And it's important for us. And so what does it do? It guides us and it leads us into this constant state of awareness. I read a post yesterday from a gentleman that, said that he, uh, he goes, uh, or when he was younger, he would go to shopping malls looking for people that need healing. Mm -hmm. And that was his ministry, was healing people. So he would just go there and sit and just watch people walk by. And all of a sudden, the Spirit would just lead him to this one person, and he would get up and say something to them, particularly if they were ill, like they, something was wrong with them. And he would just boldly say, do you mind if I ask what's going on with you? Mm -hmm. And then he would minister to them. And to me, I think that's pretty cool because that's our mandate. We're to be people of blessing and to be ready to help people. Mm -hmm. So when I, uh, I often uh, speak of this, that we have the same character. We have the same reputation. We have the, the same power and the same ability as Jesus had and also as Father has, as God has, the very same. Because... The Bible says that we are the plural of God. And I get a lot of kickback on that sometimes. Not mean, but just kickback or pushback. And, and some people say, well, what do you mean? Or where do you get that from? Or whatever. 
And so it's important for us to understand or ponder the, depth, uh, the deep thought of what it means for God to have created man. And there's a verse in the Bible that was uh, translated wrong, and it actually said that God created us a little lower than the angels in the King James. But we know the word angels mean messengers. So it said that God created man a little lower than the messengers. And, you know, first of all, you can think, well, this has the difference in spiritual understanding and no spiritual understanding. So I could sit here and say, because I study hours and hours and hours and have for 40 years, that you are just a little bit lower than me in your understanding, right? And that wouldn't offend anybody, would it? That you're just a little lower. And so I used to think that's what that meant, but it doesn't. If you take a closer look or deeper look, it suggests that God actually made man to be the plural form of God. And that's fascinating. Uh, If I was going to make somebody in my image, wouldn't I make them the plural of me? Mm -hmm. And the Bible said that we are made in the image of God. And yet we've been taught all our life that we're just less than all the time. And so in Psalm 8, 5, we find the phrase, than the angels. And this phrase was wrongly translated from the Hebrew, which is the Old Testament 430. And it's Elohim. And it literally says God's in the ordinary sense. And then it says the plural of God. And, you know, I always thought Elohim was actually God, but it is God. But also the Bible says several times, ye are gods. Even Jesus said to the Pharisees and Sadducees, your law, your, your written word says that ye are gods. And, you know, they hated him because he said he was a son of God. And yet they don't even, didn't even know that they were son of gods. So in the Hebrew, you find the word Elohah, E-L-O-W-A-H-H, means the deity, which means God, and it also means we as a visible spirit. And then Hosea 6 states that we exist as the plural of God. Now in the King James, it says, we shall live in his sight. But the word shall almost always means exist. And when you look up the word uh, uh, sight, it says the plural of a noun. What's a, what's a noun? A person, place, or thing. Mm-hmm. So we're the plural of Father God. We exist. It's not shall exist. And so Proverbs 3, 4 states that the plural of God, and then we find many other places in scriptures where the same thing, where it talks about the t- title Elohim, it's always speaking of us. It's always speaking of mankind. So, if we were formed to be lower than the messengers of God, then why was the following written in the next verse, verse 6, it says, Thou made man to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. I mean, so why do people argue with that? That we're, we're lower than God. We're lower than, quote, the angels. Because a lot of people believe in winged angels. And if, if that blesses you, I'm, t- I'm not taking it away from you. Except for my congregation. I've tried to teach them the truth on that. But that's okay. But we're not lower than them. Whatever, there's no creature ever born or ever will be that we are lower than them because we're the plural of God. And the truth is everything that Father created is out of Father, right? Yes. It's the same thing. So we have, we have dominion over the earth, but our problem is, is we haven't handled dominion over the earth. We sit there and think, well, who are we? What can we do? We can't change this world. Mm-hmm. Well, you can change your world. Yes. The first part is change this world, change my awareness, be willing to say, you know what? I need this truth. I, I need this. And then as you change your world, then you change the world around you. And there's a massive amount of people all over the world right now that are hearing these things. They're listening to me. They're listening to Kay. I hope there's other people out there teaching these truths. And if, the, if those people would grasp these truths and become the cherubim that they're supposed to be, we can change the world. And that's what I believe that Father wants us to do. And so besides knowing then, because we want to know, the word gnosis means know, we continue to live as the pearl of Father. It's one thing to know that you're something, but it's another thing to live that way, yes. right? Yes. There are people who, that have grown up in wealthy families, but a lot of them end up out on the streets. They forget who they are. 
And, you know, you sometimes you want to go find somebody and say, hey, your daddy is wealthy. Your daddy is Bill Gates or whatever. Why are you out here digging in a garbage dump? It's because they forgot who they were or they never did know who they were. So we know our true identity. And because of that, we are cheerful of character and we continue in confidence towards our father. I put my faith in father's faith in me. I no longer put my faith in me, or I don't really put my faith in you. I put my faith in my father's faith in me. And that's why I believe I'm going to live a long, long time. I'm, I'm believing that. Uh, I got, it wasn't news that I didn't believe, but we were thinking about selling one of our life insurance policies because, you know, what I was told, I wasn't going to be living very long. And I was thinking I'd rather get 120000 and put it in savings than wait for that to happen. And so I applied for it and it took them about a month and a half and they called back and said, we have bad news. You're not a good enough risk for us. In other words, you're going to live a long time. <laughs> Does that, you understand? Because yeah. what they do, they're gambling that you're going to buy, die quicker. And so I thought, I said, no, sir, that's good news. That's good news. <laughs> and I'm agreeing with that. But I also am agreeing that I'm going to live a long time in much better health yeah. and be strengthened. And we all are. So... My passion is to help people to stay, to stay in peace. My passion is for people to, uh, to, uh, that's odd. <laughs> Never hear a doorbell at church. <laughs> Allie's taking care of it. Confirmation. Yeah. <laughs> What'd you say? Confirmation, you're living forever. That's right. That's right. So my passion is for people to know peace and for people to love one another and to help people love one another. But before they can do that, they got to love their self. Because yes. however you feel about yourself, you project that out on other people. Would you agree with me? And that's why sometimes you can sit under ministries that are very angry up there. And I mean, I have. I've sat on there where their fists are so tight, their, their knuckles turn white. And they're screaming and they're hollering. And I've watched people talk on TV that are screaming and hollering. You can tell they're, they're angry inside and they can project that on you if you allowed that. And so in my studies, I have found many truths. I've explored a, a great depths of the scripture. But the, the greatest thing that I've ever found and the most important thing that I've ever found is the eternal love of God and people's true identity. I went to get the donuts today. For these two young ladies and uh, there, there was a couple there they're they're uh, I think they're from China but his wife is very pretty and so I, I told him I said you realize how you, you know how pretty your wife is don't you and he was kind of going to be honor a little bit and he just said uh, uh, and she was looking at him and he said uh, he said well if she wasn't pretty I wouldn't marry him but I, I marry her me but it was a rude thing to say wasn't it but they laughed, they laughed, and I was going to give him my uh, love without a cause speech, but I didn't. But that, that's the truth. If, if you love son, somebody because, and the because goes away, then do you still love them? And that's the problem. We love people because they make us feel good. We love people because they are beautiful. But then when we begin to age and I don't look like that great God I used to look like, does Donna love me still? Yes, that's the God I love. And that's the love that I've discovered that's changed my life. I mean, because all my life I heard that God loved me. Yes. I, mainly I heard that Jesus loved me. I, I don't think I heard much about God loving me. But, you know, we, there was this time in the 60s and 70s, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm glad for that, but can you give me something to help me with my life today? Do you love me? It's one thing to know that Jesus loves you, which if he were here, he would tell you he loves you. But it's, it's really good to know that God loves you. Yes. But what's important to know is you are love. So you can go forth and give love to the people. Yes. So we, we can never lose that union. Once we know who we are, we never lose that union. So the temple that we're going to look at here. And I probably won't finish this today. I've got 17 pages, and I don't think y'all want to stay here that long. But the temple in Scripture, in this context, represents our visible spirit. We are the temple of God. And I know you know that. 
do you got you ladies know that that you are the temple of God you're the temple of spirit I don't normally use the word God but people are used to it but there is no God out there like a physical being somewhere the Bible plainly says God is spirit I'm surprised they didn't retranslate that to something else and then, but the word spirit is a Latin word, which was not in the original. So literally it says God is breath. Yes. And we are the breath of God. So when we breathe in, we breathe in the breath of God. And when we breathe out, we breathe out the breath of God. And so we are visible spirit. We're the dwelling place of the divine, of the divine consciousness. Everything that spirit knows, you know. The Bible says we have contact with the divine mind. That's the proper translation. And we know all things. So if I know everything, I want to be aware of what I know. Yes. And that's why I spend my, as much time as I can studying. And I've heard people make comments about, well, all that studying doesn't do you any good. Well, I beg to differ. Yeah. <laughs> it helps me a lot. I'm not studying just for knowledge. I'm not studying for me. I'm studying for you. Thank you. I, I want to be somebody that brings a word to people that can change their life, that can catapult them up and to truly living out of who they are. Yeah. And I, I, I still say there's not a one of us in here that still doesn't need more understanding. Would you all agree to that? Yes. Amen. So the temple in Scripture then is us. It's, 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 the, it's the logos of the Word of God. So just as Jesus purified the temple by driving out the merchants and the money changers, and I'm going to explain that a little bit more, he didn't drive them out the way you think he did. I was looking on Google yesterday because I was going to use a picture in your notes of the temple. And I put pictures of Jesus uh, shooing the people out of the temple because that's all he did. He just shooed them away. But they were horrible. They made him look so angry. His fist was tight like a mean pre a preacher. And he was beating them with whips and all that. That's a lie. That did not happen. How can a man that's in perfect peace do anything like that? You agree with that, Christopher? It's impossible. So what do they want us to do? Huh? They're trying to what? Hold on. Take them. Take them, baby. Oh, it's those, those people down the street. Okay. Emily Stiles brought paid for donuts. Who's Emily Stiles? Tell her to come in. She's a delivery lady. She sent them? She's down in Houston, Texas. Well, thank you, Emily Stiles. Oh my gosh, she's down, there she is. She said uh, on there, yes, thank you, Emily. <laughs> That's funny. We kept running, wondering who was ringing the doorbell. Like, we were taken, but we didn't order them. <laughs> Fresh donuts all the way from Houston. <laughs> I wanted to go back. <laughs> wow, do you get it? Emily, you get a gold star in your crown today. So. Tell her we love That's her. sweet, we love you, Emily. very sweet. All right. I was thinking one of my neighbors was wanting us to move a car or something. <laughs> so uh, we get back to where I'm at here. Okay. So this the, this represents purifying thoughts and purifying beliefs by embracing the logos. When you embrace the logos, the the, the spiritual creative activity that reveals the spiritual law of abundant life. That's the logos, the word of God. It shoes away all this stuff. It's not, when we were in church, we fought, we, we bind, we rebuke the devil. I don't know how many times we killed the devil and he popped right back up, you know, and all that stuff. It was all a battle. But when you uh, embrace the logos of the word, what we are teaching, what Kay is teaching, it just kind of shoes it away. You, you don't think about that, that garbage anymore. You don't think about, you know, what was done to you. And I'm not saying you're negating what was done to you. But there comes a time that it does not control your life anymore. You know, it's like the person that did it. They're going on there with their lives. It didn't bother them. The person that cut you off on the highway, you know, and drove around you and was mean and told you that you were number one in the world. You know, <laughs> you're back here. Your blood pressure's going up. You're honking your horn. You're wishing you could just run into them. And they're just merrily going on down the road. Right. But for some reason, we, we receive that inside of ourselves, and it hurts us. And so that's what's going to remove the negative thoughts, and the negative thoughts are what hurts us all the time. Yes. My negative thoughts, you know, a lot today is, you know, it's what's going on in my body. It's pretty tough. I'm not going to sit there and say it's not hard, but I had to shoo it away. 
and I constantly do that and it's not a battle it's not and I, if I get there it's not casting down anything because if I'm casting something down then it's a battle so rather than fight it I feed on the truth and, and Jesus said the truth will make you free. It'll cause you to experience your freedom. And, you know, not just the freedom from a sin consciousness, not just the freedom from a religious system, but the freedom of all this stuff that we've allowed in here that really is holding us down and hindering us, you know. And uh, I've allowed the Lord to remove a lot from me, but there's still some things that I, I, I'm, I'm not going to quit feeding on the Logos because the minute you quit, the minute you say, oh, I've got it all, I've learned it all, everything's fine, and you're not, and you're not giving it out, then all that stuff creeps back in. Mm-hmm. So the Passover was this annual f- feast that, uh, for the Israelites, and the Jews still, again, they commemorate that today, their escape from Egypt. So Jesus used it to represent uh, the freeing of the spiritual mind and man from the dominion of the sense realm that's what jesus used this for uh he to it represents the freeing of the spiritual minded man in other words we're spiritually aware i am spirit and everybody's spirit but not everybody's spiritual mindful right not everybody knows their spirit i mean most people think we're just humans and we're not humans human means man hewn down we're not human. We are spirit wall to wall. Yes. We're not humans having a spirit, spiritual experience. Spirit's not here trying to figure out what it's, to be, what it's like to be a human, right? We are, we are spirit. And so <clears throat> this, it is part of what I, I call the regenerative process that goes into our consciousness under the inspiration of the divine mind. It is the passing over and out of one's state of consciousness. So we all need our own Passover. Not, not like Israel, not like, you know, you kill the fatted calf and all the stuff that they did. But we need our own Passover. And that Passover symbolizes the liberation from bondage to materialism and bondage to ego-based desires. Mm. Me, myself, and I. I'm just here to please myself, if you would. And uh, we do that through meditation. We do that with proper conversations. And what I mean by conversations is they're conversations with Father. So what could be a proper conversation with Father or with Spirit? First of all, it's not asking for anything. If I'm going to, the word ask means ascertain and seek and desire to know a thing. So my co- proper conversation with Spirit is... I desire to know a thing. I want to understand more. And as a student of the word, I want to understand the scripture. I want to understand more about this. I want to understand more about a world. You know, so that's proper conversation. Meditation is more of a quiet listening. And, you know, you don't, like I said before, you don't have to sit there like some of these ladies do and cross their legs. We can't do that right now. (laughs) But you don't have, but you can just, you can be walking and meditating. You can be out in your garden meditating. You can be laying in bed meditating or, or whatever. And meditating is just quieting your mind, your thoughts, if you would, not your mind, but your thoughts, and just listening. And sometimes it can be just on a subject. Uh, my friend Joanne Paddock, she meditates on righteousness all the time. I call her the righteousness queen because she studied righteousness all out through the Bible. But when you meditate and you get quiet, then the voice you hear is spirit. And you'll hear a voice. You won't always hear it saying this, but it always is doing this. It's saying this is the way walk you in it. This is the path that you need to be walking on. So we can free ourselves then from uh, limiting beliefs and patterns and awaken to the true nature of who we are because there is nothing you can't do to contact with Father. You know, the Bible says uh, all things are possible. It talks about through Christ in you. And people think that's Jesus in you. And that's not what it is. All things are possible when you're in contact with Father. Mm -hmm. There's nothing you can't do. All right? John 2, 14. And found in the temple. So this is Jesus. He came to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves. And of course, this is the King James Version. 
and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple when the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the changers money and he moved the stools they sat on. And that's a corrected translation. There were not tables that he knocked over or anything like that. You know, because we were told that he knocked all the tables over. Verse 16, and said to them that so doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. So what happened is in the temple, there were lots of cords laying around because they used cords to tie their loads on their back and the women tied things on their back. So there were lots of cords there. And when Jesus walked in the temple, he did not see peace. He did not see, it almost makes me think of a lot of church today. If Jesus had walked into a church, he would see a lot of screaming, hollering, crying, all kinds of stuff going on. But the house of God, the temple of God is supposed to be peace, that's us. Right? And so he didn't, he didn't put out the regular merchants, the people that were legally there, but he put out the people who were illegally there. The, the money that they had to give to God, which is interesting because for, uh, you know, evidently I wasn't that good a student of the word a long time ago because I didn't realize when they came there, they had to give money to the temple like they did. But it was temple money. So they had to exchange their money, their currency for temple money to be able to come to the temple and give it to God because God would not accept their currency. Isn't that crazy? I studied this and I read this in a lot of uh, Aramaic history. And so there were money changers there that were cheating them. They were not giving them the proper value of their money. And Jesus saw that was what, what was going on. Also, in the King James, it says that they, they were selling sheep and doves, but they were not. They were buying them because they knew when it came time for the sacrifice, they wanted to be the ones selling it to them because they raised the price on them. So this is a little bit of difference there. And so in the Aramaic, verse 14 says, And he found in the temple those who were buying oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers, uh, sitting. So once we can understand this, we can realize, first of all, buying and selling have the same, are the same words in the Aramaic, but a point over the second letter means selling and a dot under the second letter signifies buying. So you can see how they can really mess up the translations. And they did. I used the Prashetta translation, but there are other translations too. So understanding that Jesus dispersed this chaotic crowd conducting dishonest business, that's what he did. He wasn't mean. He didn't hurt the animals. He didn't knock the, the baskets over that have doves and all that in there. That's all religion, every bit of that. And uh, so, so the money changers were not regally, legally there. And I have to say there are things in our life that have been brought into churches that were not spiritually legally there. They were there to teach things that robbed us and hindered us. Just like in where I grew up, you didn't just tithe, you tithed on your gross. And then you tithed on anything else you got. I mean, they wanted every 10% off of every penny that you made. Those are money changers. <laughs> Those are robbers. And then we had to do a lot of work to please God. So it's almost the same thing. They came to the temple of God and they lied to us and they told us things that we needed to do to please God, not knowing that God was already pleased with us. So it was dishonesty and that provoked Jesus. And I still, I say today, if Jesus walked into Western evangelical Christianity today, he'd be very displeased. If Paul walked in, Paul was a little more fiery. He would have got up and rebuked him right there. And so, uh, so what he did is he, he didn't go in wildly with the crowd and all that. He just shooed people away. He said, get out of here. This is, my, this, this is God's house. This is, not, this is not proper here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so metaphysically, this story is a representation of cleansing our conscious awareness and our subconscious uh, and our sacred space. Yes. And again, it's gently... It's not fighting it. It's not binding it. It's not getting mad at yourself. 
It's just feed on the Logos and whatever's struggling you, it will just eventually go away yeah. and it won't be there anymore. Because then when you feed on the Logos of the Word, you, you, you're you experiencing abundant life. Abundant life does not lack peace. Abundant life does not lack calmness. You know, most people thought abundant life means I'm going to have all the money that I want. It's not about that. It just means you'll never lack. You'll get to this place where you just know whatever needs to be there tomorrow, it'll just be there. And that doesn't mean we don't go out and work, you know. I, I, we're in a society that we still need to work to bless our society to help people. But this temple is a symbol of our spiritual center. It's the place where we connect with our Father. It's a place where we connect with our divine mind. Our, our enduring temple is built upon uh, understanding our spirit is the cause of all things in life. And so these distractions, distractions can take uh, the form of material possessions. It can take the form of negative thoughts. It can take the form of emotions or any other thing that keeps us from experiencing true joy. Yes, true. Is it easy? No. We work in a world where things are tough. Mm -hmm. You know, I was talking to Allison about working with people and how employers, you know, you, you think that they are looking out for your best interest, but you're an employee. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the corporate world calls you a human resource. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what is a resource? It's something that you use up. And so what we live in this world, but we don't have to let this world affect us. And sometimes it's very hard. You know, I told you one time how I broke down and a, a, a manager just finally, he broke me and I, I just went crazy and I took a hammer and broke all my trophies and <laughs> you should have seen it. It was terrible. I came back from a trip and I, I didn't really even work for him, you know. But he took all my trophies and put them next to the trash can and said that he was tired of seeing a, a mausoleum of trophies uh, to Roy Richmond. And I said that naughty word, and I don't give a, you know what, what you, what you think. And I, I found a hammer, and they, the secretary was our administrative assistant. She got really scared, and I just started breaking them and breaking them and breaking them. You know, but you know what? I wasn't in peace at that time, was I? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus would not have done that. <laughs> well, I just want people to know that I'm, I'm there where they're at. I'm where they're at. And I, and I know. Hi, Tammy. Terry, glad you're here. I, I know that it's not easy. But the more we practice who we are, the easier it will get. Talk real loud. I just want to know if you felt better after you broke the Not at all. I cried. <laughs> I didn't cry, but I worked really hard for those trophies. I kept a couple of them, but they're all gone. They're all gone now. I finally threw them all away. So, all right. Let's get serious now. Calm down. <laughs> so, when what happens is when we go through this stuff, this negativity and the emotions and all this stuff, we, we lose our joy. And we, and we lose our peace. It's still there, but we get out of it. And just because you let somebody take you out of your seat, don't condemn yourself. Just rehearse what happened and realize, oh, I let that affect me. And I'm going to practice not doing that more and more and more. And, and, we, and we have to. And I think pretty soon we will be able to stay in peace no matter what happens. Doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. But we can just say, I'm not letting that rob me of who I am. See, Jesus' actions in the temple exemplify how we can also take actions and cleaning, allowing spirit to clean our inner awareness. We can do it in peace. And, and most of my life, I, I cried, I begged, I pleaded, you know, asking God to do something in my life. I would go to places where people lay hands on me and they tried to push me down and knock me out. and all kind, It was all a battle. Mm -hmm. But if it's a battle, then you're giving it power. That's right. Right? And it has no power. The Bible says no weapon formed against you can prosper. Well, how does that work? It's when you don't let it prosper. And so by recognizing and letting go of these distractions and attachments that hold us back, then we create this space for new growth. We create a space for transformation in our consciousness. The Apostle Paul said if there's anything worth thinking on, think about these things. 
What things? The things that he spoke, the things that he said are true of us, everything that's true of you. Every, and you can go through the scripture. And that's why I tell people, don't throw your Bibles away. No. It's ridiculous to say, oh, we don't need our Bibles anymore. Yes, you do, but you need spiritual eyes. Mm -hmm. You need to know that if it's not talking about the love of God, it's not God's word. Mm -hmm. Amen. Right? That's right. Yeah. And, and, and then you need to know from what perception is it from? I mean, if you have a man named Moses that grew up in Egypt all of his life from a baby all of his life, worshipped all kinds of gods and false gods, do you think he knew what he was talking about? I mean, he didn't even know he was spirit. He heard God's voice talking to him, but he made God, the Bible says that he made God like their other gods. He made God like animals, if you would. So... I don't follow what Moses said. Now, I look at some of the things and I try to find a metaphysical understanding of it, but I'm not going to follow those laws. I'm not going to do all that stupid stuff that they told people to do. And so you have to understand, is this a spiritual understanding or is this a carnal a perception? And then you can look in the word and you can go beneath the word and see some powerful truths. And that's what we're doing here in John. So... Paul also wrote in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, because the minute I started writing this, I remembered casting down vain imaginations. So he said in uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring it into captivity, every thought to attentively hearing the voice of the Father and through our divine mind. I paraphrase some of that. But think about that. That sounds really good, doesn't it? But the truth is, it's still a work. Because if I got to cast something down, then it's, it's a work. And, it's, and casting down is present progressive. So that means it's something you do all your life. And I used to teach that, that we always have to cast it down. And, and I used to say we cast it down by the truth of the scripture, whatever, and that's true. But the phrase casting down here in verse 5, the casting down is not there in the Greek. It was added, it's 9999. Now, casting down is there in verse 4, but in verse 5, it's not there because it would be a doing to be work. So, at the end of verse 4, the phrase casting down comes from the Greek word to lower, to lower your vain imagination. Don't let it exalt itself above you, lessen it if you would. So if you have a vain imagination that there's something you personally can do about your life, like uh, who was it uh, that I can't, I'm having, sometimes I can't think real well. The apostle that sowed Jesus out. Oh, Judas. Judas, okay, Judas. Judas had a vain imagination that he thought he could do something. Mm -hmm. He thought he could make Jesus uh, go ahead and take over. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that's what he did. And he had a vain imagination. And then there are other places in the Bible where people felt like they could do something about their self, and that was a vain imagination. Correct? And so it speaks of our spiritual use of the Logos, which replaces the lower strongholds and thoughts in your belief. The, ca the casting down actually means it. It means to lower. So how do you lower something? You feed on the truth. Yes. When you think you're a bad person, person you think nobody likes you nobody loves you or whatever that's a lie so how do you lower it down you speak the truth right the bible says you're altogether lovely the bible says you're perfect the bible says you're holy right so there it speaks of our spiritual use the logos which replaces that stronghold so whatever stronghold you have just feed on the truth you know years ago when i didn't know a lot of this I would just tell people, you need to know Jesus more. In a sense, I was right, but you, I should have said, you need to know more what Jesus taught. But one of my good friends from Full Gospel Assembly, one time I was talking to her, she was going through a lot of problems, and she said, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, I need to know Jesus more. <laughs> you know, so she was right. That wasn't the answer. I need to know what Jesus said about me more. I need to know what Paul said about me more. I need to know what God said about me. And God said that I'm perfect and I am the very image of God. So I must be beautiful because there is no ugliness. There is no lack in us whatsoever. 
And so in this way, the story of Jesus in the temple then exemplifies the importance of maintaining a clear and an open channel and communication with spirit. We should carve out all the time we can just to listen to spirit. And if you don't know how to do it, just be quiet. Because God's talking all the time. All the time. You just, you need to be quiet. You know, uh, my body, I struggle a little bit with hearing. Donna does too. And so we're in here watching TV and Donna will start talking to me and I can't hear a word she's saying. And I say, what, what, what? Well, I had to clear the, uh, the, the number one distraction out. I turn my TV down. Okay. When I turn my TV down, then I can hear. Her. So what do we need to do if we say, I can't hear God? Turn those other voices down. Turn off the TV. Turn off the TV. <laughs> yeah. But turn off the lie. Yeah. Turn, turn, just say, I'm not listening to that anymore. Mm-hmm. And then if you'll be calm and quiet, literally you will hear the voice of Father. Have you ever heard the voice of the Father in your life? Guess, guess, who, guess who he sounds like? You. When, when the Father speaks to our, our, our thoughts, that's how we hear Father, it sounds just like you. Would you, you all agree with me? Yes. It doesn't sound like some big old God out there hollering at you, but it sounds like you. And then it will conform to the truth. What would you say? said it's not Morgan Freeman's voice. No, it's, it's not Morgan. Even though it sounds nice, it's not Morgan Freeman. Okay, a few more minutes. Can y'all take one more? Okay, John 2, 17. While watching Jesus, his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. I've heard verses, this, this verse used to, conf, uh, to confirm that Jesus was mad and he was mean, and he was angry, and he beat him with a whip, because it says he made a whip, which he did not. And so they use this verse. And this statement, the zeal of thine house has eaten me up, is a northern Aramaic idiom, which means the zeal of your house has made me courageous. Has made me courageous. And another way to put it would be, the zeal has strengthened me to defend your house, or defend my house. When Jesus walked in there, he saw the abuse of the people. And he was defending his people, his kinship. Does that make sense? Yes. That's all he was doing. And so another way is, I have come to comfort you or to look after the interests of my family. That's what Jesus was doing. He was looking after the interests of my family. I believe that you guys love me enough that if you came somewhere and you saw somebody abusing me, you would stop it, would you not? Yeah. And so that's all he did. But he didn't stop it with anger. So the people there were his family. We're his, we're his family. Jesus is our elder brother. Yes. And there's a, a lot of other comforter messengers out there that are elder brothers. So uh, the people were there, and uh, they were under the control of the Jewish leaders. They were under control of the Roman Empire. So spiritually, Jesus was there to free them from religiosity and free them from the control of the Roman Empire over them to teach them how to relate to the Romans, if you would. But they, they, they were not to be their source. And he was t- there to show people that God was their source. We have a true supply. We have an eternal supply. The Bible says we have all things pertaining to life and godliness. I believe both of those are the same thing. Because God, we used to say physical life and spiritual life, but we're not physical, we're spiritual. So we have everything pertaining to this visible spirit, whether it's food, whether it's water, whether it's money, it's here. And when we begin to believe that and relate to that and identify to that, then it starts showing up in your life and you begin to see things that's, wow, this, this is true. I don't have to worry about it anymore. And so he was there to teach them that truth. And Jesus felt grieved when he saw that in the temple. And I have to tell you, after I began to learn a lot of truth, we were teaching the finished work of Jesus Christ. We were teaching penal substitution. That means Jesus had to die because we were bad people, which is not true at all. Then I would go to some of these conferences and they would get up and teach that stuff. I felt grieved. And my, and my, my awareness that, my heart awareness, because people were still hearing this lie. 
And I have people that are teaching out there that follow me right now. And I've talked to all of them and I love them all. But they're not, they're not where we're at yet in the spiritual side. So they're still wanting to teach penal substitution. And even though the majority of the people in the world, that's where they're at, I'm still grieved about that. Because the more you teach it to them, the more it's going to affect their life. And it affects it negatively, not positively at all. You know, penal substitution makes you believe that what Jesus did saved everybody. What Jesus did is what made us righteous and holy. And it's not true. Father did that from the foundation of the world. And we never lost it. Jesus came to reveal that to us. And so he felt grieved when he saw that in the area, which was to be a place where people were together and seek to know Father. That's what the temple is always for. And the Bible says that God is spirit and God seeks those who worship him in spirit and truth. And the word worship also means ascertain, seek, and desire to know. So Father seeks us. Spirit seeks. Spirit. I mean, I don't know how to explain spirit to you. I haven't found anybody really that can explain spirit because it's not visible, right? But spirit is alive. Spirit is energy. And that energy is always seeking us to know the truth of who we are. So energy can work properly in our bodies, in our being. And so the zeal over father, fathers, sons, and daughters being abused made Jesus courageous enough to go shoo those people out of there and say, this house is a place that's supposed to be peace. This is supposed to be a place that people are coming to know God. God entrusted his truth to the Jew, to Jewish people uh, when he brought them out of Egypt. But they didn't listen. Just like Abraham, he didn't listen to God. God said, I don't want your sacrifice. And he still went and got a ram and sacrificed it. Uh, the word obey in the Bible means listen attentively. It doesn't mean to obey like it's a law, but to listen attentively. So if you obey what I'm saying to you today, you're listening attentively to it and you're going to let it change your life. And so this zeal brought Jesus this enthusiasm. And this is the enthusiasm that we need to keep us on our mandate, mission and ministry that we realize that there are people in our world that have been abused spiritually, spiritually abused. And our job is to go to them when Father opens our eyes to them and help them and say, listen, I can't tell you I know how you feel, but I know how I felt when I was under all this religious teaching. And it didn't feel very good. I never felt holy. I never felt pure. I never felt right with God. I always felt I was doing something wrong, but I found something out. Would you like for me to share it with you? And how many people would say no to that? Not too many. Some might be. Some are happy where they're at. But there are plenty of people out there who say, yes, I would like to know. And you'd be surprised how many people you can begin to minister to these ways. So allegorically for us driving out the abusers would to be root out our dependence on man-made solutions and hindered hindrances and things that traduce us and things that compromise our spiritual growth. And yes, it's the political system, it's the religious system, it's the metal, financial and social. They're all man-made solutions. I don't want to be dependent on them, but currently they do affect us. So we do need to pay attention to what's going on, but I also think we need to be speaking righteous words over these people and, and, and send it out, send that energy out and speak that you will do right, you will be a statesman, you will look out after future generations. But it's gonna take a lot of people to do that. And maybe not. Maybe it can just take one like Jesus that can speak to the storm and say, peace, calm down, and it obeyed him. And so if we can do what Jesus did, then why not? So in closing here, when we wholly depend on any system of this earth, political, religious, medical, financial, social, we are traduced to our true supply, which is spirit. And these systems out there are wanting us to be totally dependent on them. They're convincing people that we know what's best for you, medical, religious, financial, political, all of it, and we can be your supply. And every time that happens, it destroys that country, yes, it does. right? Everywhere. So in verse 18, which we're going to get there in a minute, 
or, or, or next week, the Jewish authorities were spying on Jesus for the Pharisees. And we will see that they desperately needed an upgrade in their consciousness. And that's what we need. We need an upgrade in our consciousness. They ask, what sign do you show us seeing that you do these things? This action at the temple entrance was, uh, it, it was, it was dis displaying that he had authority. They could tell that he had authority and they wanted to know where that came from. So we're going to see that next week. So I hope you enjoyed this. Appreciate you've been here. And yes, Carol, it means listen attentively. So I know you do that. I can see people talking on Facebook. <laughs> so, but we love all of you. Thank you for being here. Uh, for those of you uh, listening on Facebook, if you're new, we have resources available to you. You can go to my webpage, which is Dr. Roy, middle initial E, as with Edward, Edward and Richmond. So Dr. Roy E. Richmond dot com. And you'll find out everything you need to know. Bless you. And I hope to see you next week. Bye bye.